Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We will now be kicking off our third session of the Sales and BizDev track today, and we're excited to welcome Jose Martins back to the stage to share more about frictionless selling lean and removing friction to accelerate growth. This presentation will re review what frictionless selling is and why it matters, the evolution of sales in search of convenience, and the three-step process to implement frictionless selling. I'll now kick it over to Jose, the Business Development Manager at HubSpot. Thank you, Erica. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, this is a topic that has been uh, that I've been so passionate to be talking about uh, in the last year or so. It's something we've we've been recently working more and more here at HubSpot. Um, and and so I'm, I'll just get going. Just before we start with the actual content, I just want to remind you that the reason we we're delighted to be here is because of this great partnership we have with Austin Startup Week and with Capital Factory um, with um, Hubs for Startups. So so quick plug, Hubs for Startups is a great program we have to support founders and early stage startups uh, with their growth, but with access to educational resources and sessions like this one, but also access to our software platform at scholarship discounts. So if you're interested, uh, just search for my name on LinkedIn and ask me questions or go directly to hubspot.com slash startups. And that's it. I'm gonna go into our frictionless sales um, topic today. So uh, I'm very passionate about this because I think the world, we've been talking about how marketing has been evolving for a while, right? Uh, since the inception of like maybe HubSpot, right? Inbound marketing about 15 years ago. But really what we've been noticing lately is there's a huge, there's a huge arbitrage opportunity in the sales area. But by arbitrage, we mean there's a huge opportunity to gain a competitive advantage by doing things differently. And by doing things differently without having to invest a ton of money to achieve that, which is a great, great news for a startup. So uh, what is this change and why is this opportunity have come about? Like how did it originate? So in, in, we have to go back to like the evolution of buying, right? And sales, but what the evolution of buy, buying has been defined by one common theme, which is the, the search for convenience. Further along and as time goes by and history as history. Uh, gets its course, uh, we're consistently trying to look for ways that is easier for us to sell and easier for us to buy products and services. So it really is today where like maybe 10 or 20 years ago, the main thing you needed to do to win and to scale a company is you needed to have a product that was 10 times better. That is not so much the case today. With like very few exceptions, most products and services are relatively the same order of magnitude, same quality, kind of same quality, like the good ones, right? So what really helps you win is not what you sell, it's how you sell it. So the, and that's where the, the whole concept of friction, like, uh, frictionless uh, selling comes in. And so if we think back to this concept of the evolution of search for convenience, if you look back at history, like Hundreds of years ago, it was really hard and painful to buy something, right? You had to exchange and try to figure out, well, if I'm buying corn, how much do I give back in pelts or whatever it is, right? Like, what's the exchange and what's, what's fair? Like, if we, we go forward a few hundred years, now we buy from the couch, right? Even during this kind of really weird year we've had in 2020, like most of us have been able to kind of access the products and services we want from our home without leaving our home because we buy from the couch. And if we look at different industries, that that evolution to convenience has been a constant on every industry, right? Like in, the, in the music industry, we, we, we used to buy in record stores. I remember going to Virgin, right, to buy CDs. Uh, this was only 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. That's not that long uh, ago. I remember when iTunes came out, it was huge, right? You were buying records by, by, by track. Now you don't even buy music, you rent it on Spotify. And it's the same with other industries. So, there's a continuous drive for convenience from buyers. And the companies that adapt to making it more convenient for buyers to buy their products or services are going to win. Now, convenience will, will definitely mean something different depending on what you're selling, right? We have thousands of startups in this, in this uh, event today and this week at Austin Startup Week. And like you all sell different things, different products and different services. And, Convenience in your industry for your company means something different. Like if, if, we talk, if we talk about a toothbrush, convenience selling a toothbrush or buying a toothbrush is very different than convenient buying a Tesla, 
right? And so how do we define convenience? Uh, and the way we define convenience is we try to think of products. And if we're trying to design our goal to market, what we're trying to think of our products in two dimensions from the point of view of the buyer. So one of the dimensions is, of course, price, right? If something is very expensive or if something is relatively cheap, like a toothbrush or like a Tesla. The other dimension is, well, what's the degree of change to my life? Like, if I'm buying something new of high cost, like a Tesla, I'm going to, I'm going to need a lot, of, a lot of help, right? I'm going to need to handhold my customer. There's a lot of, there's a ramp up in understanding and education that I need to supplement with a ton of resources, uh, a specialized, very edu educated, very prepared sales team to guide customers through that buying process. Now, if I start, if I go to the other extremes, like a toothbrush, like people know what a toothbrush is. There's no education needed. There's not a lot of cost involved either. So really what customers need is to make it as simple and easy as possible to buy a toothbrush. Like you don't need any sort of um, um, intervention from a human. Now, there are, other, there are two other categories that are kind of tricky, right? Like when you have a high degree of change to the buyer, it's a low cost item, like an Echo. Like a, an Echo is like 20 bucks, 25 bucks, right? It's not hugely expensive, but it's, if, you, if you look at like maybe one or two years back, like it's a very, very new technology. So for us, the buyers getting an Echo is not so much about getting sales support or getting education. Uh, it's, so, it's more about reducing our risk of trying that new, relatively inexpensive um, technology. So how are we supporting our buyer to go through that kind of education and you want to do it at a scale, right? Like a one-to-many setting because you can't spend a lot on go-to-market resources. Like you can't have a sales team calling people to sell echoes. That, that wouldn't be profitable. Uh, and then on the other hand, right, the other uh, diagonal, op opposite diagonal to the echo is a mattress, right? A mattress, not a huge degree of change to the buyer, right? People have been buying mattresses for a while now, but it is high cost, right? Most people will buy a mattress, spend, you know, maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand dollars on a good mattress, maybe more. Um, and then they'll stay with that for years. So it's not it's not a huge change, but it's a big decision and it's an expensive decision. So how do you support that? So how the go to market looks like there is you have to make it easy for people to buy because they know what they're buying, but you have to reduce that cessation of risk by having a ton of help available once they buy. Like a great example of a company doing a great go-to-market kind of strategy here is Purple, right? Very easy to, to buy a Purple mattress, but you feel okay by buying it because you know you, you have that 90-day guarantee. If you don't like it, you return it. So you feel less of a risk making that big investment in the master. So First thing when we're thinking about frictionless selling and, and, and adjusting to the buyer is we first need to understand where our go-to-market falls in these kind of four categories. Is it a high hold? Is it risk mitigation? Is it like a low touch, kind of like a toothbrush? Or is it like um, that, that matters where you need to streamline buying, but also invest a ton of resources on supporting the buyer once they buy the product. So uh, that's that's how... And, and by the way, like B2C companies have been doing a pretty decent job at adjusting to buyers' expectations. But when you go to B2B, you know, the B2B buyers are the same people. So they're expecting kind of the same great experiences in buying, but most B2B sellers are not adjusting. So what a modern B2B buyer is expecting today uh, or how they behave today is that they first, they engage when they're ready. Right, they do their homework. They do research online. They ask peers for information, for references. Um, they 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 expect rapid responses. Right, they, they don't expect that like nine to five service. They expect they expect twenty four seven answer within five minutes in the B two B segment. Right, like they want kind of that same same consumer level experience of buying when they're buying B two B products and services. Um, so that's one thing. They, they engage when they're ready and they expect a rapid response. There's very little patience from buyers when they're, they're interacting with B2B sellers. Second is they really expect more of the seller. Right? Um, when I bought, when I first moved to the US 12 years ago and the, what my, one of my first kind of bigger purchases was a TV. 
and I went to Best Buy, right? And when I went to Best Buy, I kind of relied a little bit on the salesperson to kind of guide me through the options. Like I would not think of it today. Like I just bought a TV last year and I did my entire research online. So when I go to a B2B sales or a B2B buying experience, it's kind of the same, right? A lot of information is being consumed on the internet uh, through research. And so when I come and interact with a B2B sales team or a B2B sales exec, I'm expecting more of a deeper product expertise, like very deep, detailed product expertise, not just information. Like information is no longer a premium. Having information about the product, that can be found online. So I really need a pro, uh, an army of product experts um, who are leading our sales team to make sure that buying experience is um, is delightful. And the third thing is, you know, people buy on their terms. This is why subscription-based models are becoming more um, common in B2B. Right? People want to buy online whenever possible. If they have, if they can buy without interacting with a human being, it's better unless they really need to, the help. They actually prefer to try before they buy. So I want to buy online. I don't want to have this kind of long process of sales or of buying with a sales exec or a team of sales exec. Um, I want to buy relatively easy, but I want to kind of be able to try before I commit financially long term to something, right? And I'm going to buy whenever I want. So it's not. I'm not going to engage with you. I'm trying to. And I'm not going to be forced to buy. You know, at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter, like. They, they don't want to kind of engage in those gimmicks that most sales, old, old style salespeople used to use. They just want to buy when they want. They want to cancel when they buy, uh, when they want. And they want to commit as little as possible upfront. So monthly subscriptions, much better than these annual kind of um, engagements or, or commitments. So these are the three things that modern B2B buyers are expecting. Now, as you, as you know, most B2B sellers are not doing this, right? Most companies keep selling the old fashioned way. And that old fashioned way is filled with friction, right? It's creating a ton of frustration with the buyers. It's also creating a ton of frustration within the sales teams. And so if you look at sales teams today, rotation in sales teams is much, much faster than it was a few years ago. Like a few years ago, like maybe one or two decades ago, you could see these kind of career salespeople at companies, even tech companies, like 10, year, 10 years in the same sales team. Like today, if you get a sales rep for two years in your software company, there is a huge success. That is because there's so much frustration with uh, the internal processes that there's a lot of friction also internally in the teams. So like friction is everywhere, right? Again, internally with our teams, it's very frustrating that with all the technology available, we still see that about two thirds of a rep's day is spent not in doing sales. That's huge. That's a huge waste. That's one of the biggest challenges and, 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 and problems to address as a company today is if you map out the perfect, the ideal day for a rep, which is basically almost 100% of their time selling, and you compare it to the reality with only 33% of the time they're selling, there's a huge opportunity for improvement there. So that's one. Efficiency is going to be a big um, element to focus on as you evolve into a more modern sales team, which is a, a frictionless sales team. The second problem we have today, second source of friction that we have between B2B sales teams, B2B buyers, is uh, relationships are at, at, are at an all-time low, right? 60% of B2B buyers say they distrust the integrity, the integrity of salespeople, like that's 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 not that's not um, um, trivial, right? Like when you say I distrust the integrity of salespeople, what I'm saying is, as a buyer, I don't think that you're trying to help me. I don't think you're trying to help me solve my problem. I just think you're trying to get to your quota. Like sixty percent of people openly say. They think that way. There is a huge problem of mistrust that needs to be addressed. And it has to do a, a lot with misalignment between sales teams and buyers. And we're going to talk about alignment as well. The third thing is this learning culture. So that the more modern sales teams are embedding in their operating system more time devoted, devoted to 
learning and improvement. So coaching, training, and a deeper product knowledge or deeper service knowledge, um, um, money that they give you every year to kind of invest in education. So there's a ton of transformation in the culture of sales teams that need to go on today. Like in the past, you would hire a salesperson based on their Rolodex, right? Who do you know? Which of your customers and relationships do you bring when I hire you? This is like very old fashioned. This is like maybe 20 years ago. Today, you don't really care so much about that. What you care is about, can I embed a culture of training, coaching, and education in my sales team where they're consistently improving and adapting to an, an evolving um, buyer in the B2B segment? So learning has to become a huge um, pillar of modern sales teams. So we have these three problems. We have a changing environment in the buyer um, um, aspect of things. So we, we really need to rethink sales. We really need to look at how we've been doing sales for the past 20 years and think of a new way of selling. And so that's where we, what we're calling frictionless selling. It's a new way of making sales that is more convenient for the buyer, but also for the seller, right? It makes it less friction for both sides of the equation. So how do we do this? Uh, how do we do this so that we can grow better our companies? The way we do it is, and by the way, if you have questions as we go through, please ask them as we go. I'm, it's by, by no means I'm expecting to go through all of this without any sort of questions. So if you have questions, please ask them on the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll be receiving them and addressing them as we go. So going back to friction lesson. So the first thing we do is we figure out how to align our or go to market with our buyer. So we need to look at our product and our buyer and figure out where do they land on this chart. Now, here's the complex part, or here's the, the tricky part. Some of your products, let's say you have one product, maybe that one product could fall in multiple areas here. Like if you think again, if you take again the, the example of Tesla, like Tesla, as soon as like maybe two years ago or three years ago, like you, you had to go to that showroom in the mall, to kind of get an understanding of what it was, why it was so expensive and all that stuff, right? Because it was a new technology. You needed a very, um, very hand, a lot of hand holding to buy your Tesla. And when they released the, the Model 3 a year ago, like they were enabling online uh, buying. Like you could just go online or pick up a phone and win, within one minute, you could buy a, a Model, T, uh, Model 3 Tesla. What that means is for different personas, for different types of buyers, they have different models. So right? one is handheld, the other one is like a streamline and support model. Um, some of you will have multiple products. Like it, HubSpot is an example of this. At HubSpot, we have products for certain um, buyer personas that we need handholding. So like our corporate customers and our enterprise level software, they need handholding. Now, most of our startup customers, they're very knowledgeable of technology. So for us, it's more of a streamline and support uh, go to market, even for enterprise level software, because we know our, for the most part, most of our startup buyers actually don't need to speak with a sales rep. They kind of understand that technology. They want to buy online without interacting with a sales team. What they want to make sure that they have is once they buy, can I try before they buy, before I buy? And second, once I buy, how much of how much support do I have, so I don't feel there's a huge risk when I um, when I buy a subscription of HubSpot. So same product, um, different personas. You you'll be in different categories, or maybe different products for the same company, maybe in multiple categories. So it's it's kind of it's kind of tricky, but this is the first step. Figure out where you are here. The next thing is once you know that you move into our frictionless selling implementation network or, or framework, sorry. So the framework is, is three steps. You enable, you align, and you transform. So the acronym for this is EAT, uh, which is not a great acronym, but it works. So it's E-A-T, enable, align, and transform. So first is you, you, you want to kind of go and, and address the easiest um, thing to address, which is that that is right in front of you. You have an inefficient sales team. So you first want to kind of enable that sales team to be more efficient. The next thing is you want to align your sales team 
to your buyer. You want to make sure that the buying process and the selling process are in sync. The third thing is you want to embed in your sales operating system, as we mentioned, a culture of continuous learning. And we're going to go through each of these three in detail. Now, before I go there, we have some questions. How do you build trust with your customers? Any tips on being genuine and authentic? Uh, yes. So it, it, it's it, part of this kind of um, part of this framework enables you to be genuine and authentic. The the first part is if you're if you're adjusting the way you sell to the way people buy. So not based on how you want to sell because it's profitable, but how how do you align to how people want to buy because it's easier for them? That goes a long way in being genuine and authentic. The other thing is, if you have a very um, educated or, or a team that is continuously learning, receiving coaching, how to do things better, if you have a team that is efficient, that is aligned with the buyer, that has enough pipeline to the, where they can actually be helpful to their customers, you're going to, you're going to get, end up in the right side. Uh, where you end up in the wrong side is usually when you have a sales team that is not aligned with the buyer, they're not receiving coaching, and they have a very scarce pipeline of deals. So like a sales rep, I, I've been a sales rep for a while. Like I'm not one right now, but I, I was a sales rep for 10 years. And the sales rep lives and dies by his or her quota. Now, if you're above quota all the time because you have a strong pipeline, you can be helpful. So if you're effective, if you're efficient, if you're receiving coaching, if you're aligned with your buyer, you're going to have a healthy pipeline of business. So you don't need to close this customer. You just need to close a customer. You, you have to just be helpful. When you have to close this one customer, because if this one customer, you don't get to quota or you might get fired, that's when you stop being genuine and authentic. So that this, this framework goes a long way in helping you ensure that. Um, my company just did a workshop on trust. How do we prioritize trust in our sales team? So I, I think kind of this goes a little bit. It, um, it's kind of the same answer that I gave before to, to being genuine and authentic. Developing trust is, do you as a buyer understand that what I'm doing is trying to help you? And what am I doing to make that visible, to make that uh, obvious? And so as soon as I feel like I'm just a number on your quota, that's when you lose trust, that's when you're not genuine and authentic, that's when you get to the gimmicks, right? Like, hey, if you buy by the 31st, I can give you that 20% discount, but the day, a day after that, right? The 1st of November, I can no longer give you the 20%. That makes no sense, right? That made sense 20 years ago, but if you think about it logically, that makes absolutely no sense for any business. So you, you again, you have to have a, a team that is productive, that is aligned with the buyer, that is continuously being coached to improve how they sell so that you have a better experience for the buyer. So if we go about implementing Enable, Align, and Transform, how do we look at it? So I'm going to go through these three, and I'm going to address three aspects. One is kind of we're going to compare the old way and the new way. Then we're going to talk about what are some of the steps that you go through to implement enabling, aligning, and transforming. And then we're going to look at what are some of the KPIs you have to, you could be tracking to make sure you're moving in the right direction. So we'll start with enable. So enabling is basically, you think of a sales process. The ideal scenario is my sales team, every single sales rep is 100% of their time selling, interacting with a customer. Now we know that's impossible. Now from 100 to 33, that's a lot of opportunity for improvement. So what we have to do is we wanna map out the ideal process and then we want to kind of think where, where are the sources of inefficiency and see if we can remove that through either redesign of processes or enabling with technology. So here's what the old way of selling looks like and here's how the modern way of looking of selling looks like. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but in the old way, you're basically going from the inside out. So you're outbound, you're trying to hunt for, for customers, you're trying to find them somewhere, they're trying to push product or push sale or trying to push them through a pipeline or a funnel of sales until they buy, right? Um, there's very little context as to why you, why now, why you prospect, why, why now? 
um, there's a little information for the rep to understand if I have 10 leads on my CRM right now, which one is the most likely to buy, right? Where should I invest my time? When a rep is using technology to help document what's going on, uh, most of old systems and the old way is I have to manually enter data. I have to go at the end of the day and register my calls or my emails. With a new way, everything happens automatically. Again, you shouldn't have a rep block one hour of their day to log their interactions with customers. That should all happen automatically. That's a modern way of selling. Um, most of my demand is coming inbound, right? The marketing team is feeding the sales team with demand. And I'm receiving clear signals. Uh, the system, whatever system I'm using, is giving me clear signals of where to invest my time. So the worst uh, source of inefficiency for a sales rep is to spend time with a non-buyer. So what you want to do is, ideally, you want my first interaction with a customer of today is going to be with that customer that has a higher likelihood of buying. Now, you could use AI for that. You could, there's several systems like HubSpot is one of them that can give you an idea of, of these you know, 100 leads, what are the five that are most likely to buy? Start with those, right? So you want the system to help you kind of organize your day. Uh, so a key activities, as I said before, you want to map out your process and remove inefficiencies. And you want to leverage technology to, to build productivity um, as much as you can, right? Building with automation whenever possible. And what do you measure to make sure you're moving in the right direction? So I would say probably you just want to you want to look at code attainment. That's the number one. The number two is how much of your time are you actually selling? And you could do this by measuring with with um, with your systems and measuring activity. But you could also kind of talk with your reps and your sales teams and yourself if you're selling. Like right? how much of my time did I spend today selling? If if I work today a ten hour day or an eight hour day. How many of those eight hours were I, was I actually interacting with a customer? How many of those hours were I, was I not selling? And I want to move that uh, up, right? I want the most of my time be in selling. So that's how you kind of address the enabling part. Uh, once you have a more productive team, that's the easy win, right? You just go look inside and just make some improvements. Second thing is you really need to look at how your buyer is going through that decision process and align ruthlessly to how they, um, they buy your product or service. So we can go back to that kind of framework of high degree of change, price, and where do you land there? Once you have a good idea of how your buyer persona buys, then you have to kind of align with them. So how does misalignment look like? It looks like the old way of selling, right? Uh, I'm available nine to five. Who has been a victim of that? Like I have, right? Several times with several uh, suppliers. They're only available nine to five. It takes forever to get them on a, um, on a meeting, right? I send an email, hey, I want to buy from you. But I sure, let's meet, right? When can you meet? Wednesday at 10 a.m. Oh, I can't Wednesday at 10 a.m. And you have these seven or 10 emails just trying to figure out how to schedule a meeting, right? Once we get into that sales process, I just go through a sales funnel. As a buyer, I'm just going through a sales funnel. There's hostile negotiations. There's a rigid sales process that the sales rep is following that has nothing to do with how the buyer is trying to buy. And whenever they decide they want to actually buy from me, I'm asking heavy upfront commitments. It's kind of like that Comcast plan where you're like, you're going to get a good price, but you have to commit to two years upfront. Well, that doesn't work, right? I want to do it more like Hulu. Like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have full Hulu this month. Next month, I don't want to have Hulu. I want to have Netflix. I'll just cancel Hulu for one month. There's no penalties. I can... Um, buy it again in October, in November, in December, whenever I want. I could suspend for three months. Nothing's going to happen. So uh, buying online, canceling at any time is more of the new way, the frictionless way. 24-7 access to your team. Now, could you have a human 24-7 uh, available? Most of us can't, right? Like even at HubSpot, we can't always do that. But unless we be a chatbot, we can at least help service a big portion of our customers. If someone wants to meet with us, here's our calendar. Like just book a time. Here's when I'm available. When does it work for you? Just pick a time. Kind of if you know Calendly, that's a good tool. HubSpot has its own tool for that. Just make it easy for people. If they want to get on the phone with you, how can you make it as easy as possible for them to achieve that? Now, who is going to determine how 
And when the project or the subscription is starting, the buyer is deciding that, right? It's not you. So you shouldn't have, if you look at your sales, you shouldn't have these kind of flat sales in the first, let's say you have monthly quota. You won't want to have like the first 25 days of your month looking like this and like the last three months looking like this. That means your sales reps are pushing buyers to buy before the end of the month. So they, those numbers come in their monthly numbers. That's a buyer, uh, a seller centric process. What you want to have is something that looks kind of constant through time. Like some people buy on the first, some people buy, will buy your product on the fifth or the 15th or the 20th. Doesn't matter because the buyer is actually the one that is deciding when to start using your product or service, right? Um, oh, and transparent buying and pr uh, pricing and discounting, huge, right? It's for me incredible to see today how we can have how we can have um, companies where you want to buy their product. Let's say software. You want to go and buy their software, and you have to click talk to sales to figure out how much it costs what they're selling. That makes no sense to me. Your pricing should be on the on your website all the time, even if you're a consulting business. You should have a range, and it's not only for your buyer; it's for you as well. Like you don't want someone to uh, consume the resources of your sales team if they're not going to be able to afford what you have to sell. So you want to have transparent pricing um, uh, on your website. So that's how you kind of align in the modern way. So key activities, simplify buying process, try to have as much online sales as you can if it, if it uh, makes sense for your buyer persona. Make sure you engage with, with your buyer on their preferred channels, right? If you prefer to talk on the phone, that's good for you. But what do your prospects prefer? Some may need phone, some may need chat, some prefer the chatbot, some prefer Facebook, some prefer Slack, some prefer email. So you have to kind of figure out who your buyer is and figure out, okay, do I have the channels for them to interact with me? So if you go to HubSpot, you can call in, you can email in, you can go to our chat. So we have enabled different channels for you to interact with us and buy from us in your preferred way of buying, not in our preferred way of selling. So engage with them on their terms and preferred channels. And of course, as these questions before um, on, the, on, the, on the chat here is you, you have to focus on building authenticity and trust. Like, can you really make sure people understand you're there to help? You're genuinely trying to help. That's huge. Um, and so what do you measure? You measure close rates, right? How many of the people who intended to buy from you actually ended up buying from you? And you want that kind of to be going up. What's the time to close? If you have a, a, an aligned modern sales process, your time to close should be much shorter. Now I'll give you an example. Like we're very aligned with our startup buyers. We know and we understand that most of our startup buyers, when they want to buy HubSpot, they, they know what they're doing. They just buy online. Because of that, the closing rates of interested people in our startups community is the highest close rate of all of HubSpot. The time to close is the shortest of all of HubSpot. And the buyer experience is the highest of all of HubSpot. That's just because we completely aligned with how our buyers buy. Now, a year ago, you actually had to click on talk to sales before you bought HubSpot. And we were getting a lot of feedback from our customers saying, hey, I know what I'm doing. I know tech. Um, I know MarTech. I just need somewhere to buy online. I don't need to talk with anyone. I just want to buy. So it's an evolution process. But if you're aligning, you're going to see these metrics go up. And then finally, this is an important part. It, it, it takes more time. It takes more of a deliberate um, intention because it just doesn't happen like a culture of learning won't just happen you have to be um, deliberate about making this happen and so i'll tell you how this looks like like how does a, an old-fashioned culture sales team looks like and how a modern one looks like and all the old way um sales team operated is you had managers who would meet their reps to check on their pipeline that was the whole meeting what's your pipeline What's on your pipeline? What has closed? What has moved? What has um, a chance of closing this month or this quarter? That was the whole thing. And then there was some sort of coaching on how to move that deal forward. But it's only based on your pipeline. 
and it's only based on like the spreadsheets. So that was terrible. The second aspect of the old fashioned culture is you get hired to join a sales team. It's like, hey, you better know what you're doing. You're going to pick up on your first day or your first week after your first week on the roll. You're going to be picking up phone, the phone or you're going to be starting to send mails. And, you know, it's sink or swim, right? If you're good, you're going to you're gonna, uh, swim. You're going to do well. If you don't know what you're doing, then tough luck. A month after you were hired, you're fired. That doesn't work. Not a lot of coaching, not a lot of training. Uh, so it's a terrible onboarding process. Uh, the third aspect of the old fashioned culture of sales goes back to these questions before about trust and um, and being genuine and authentic. It's in the past, a sales rep job was to take a lead and convert them into a customer. Now, that's the wrong incentive for the, for the rep. If my only job is to convert a lead into a customer, I'm not very incentivized to make sure that this is someone who actually needs my product. That I'm making sure that they know why they need my product and that I'm setting this customer up for success using my tool. So in the past, your compensation was based on your sales. Modern sales team actually have accountability for success. So like at HubSpot, if a sales rep So in the, in the past, uh, in, in HubSpot, it's a mo more modern sales team. Uh, sales reps are not only measured by how much money net new customers they bring into HubSpot, they're actually measured on the success and renewal rate of our customers. So if, if a customer of ours churns, it negatively impacts the, um, how much money the rep makes. So that's the sales are accountable for success. There's a, a deliberate, attempt to making onboarding for new reps as high class or as, as good as possible. Like we have an entire team just dedicated to design what's the best way to train our new reps so that they're successful once they get on the phone. Um, and managers have to embed hours of coaching for their team and for one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with the reps as part of their operating system. So how do you measure uh, what are the key activities you, you perform? You have to develop a, an army of product experts. So how much training are you, are you providing to your, to your, um, to your team? How, much hour, how many hours of coaching are part of the routine week of your sales manager? Right? How much do your reps look at the MPS and customer feedback from the customers they closed? Right? If a customer that I closed gives a positive 10 out of 10 MPS um, feedback or response after their first month as a HubSpot customer, I should know that as a rep and the contrary as well. If after one month of using HubSpot, my customer gave an NPS of one, they hate it, they want to churn, I should know that, right? Like I should be receiving feedback from the customers that I, um, that I closed. So these are key activities that you should embed in your culture of learning sales team. And then key metrics, as I said before, I think the number one is customer retention. Like you really want the sales team to be accountable for retention of customers, customer happiness, NPS. How many referrals are you getting from the customers you closed? Right? Like the best way to grow in an accelerated way to become viral in a way, even as a B2B company, is how much of a percentage of your new leads are coming from your marketing efforts, how many are coming from your uh, referrals. The larger the referral proportion, the more viral you are, right? And the lower the cost of acquisition, the closer, the faster the close rates, the higher the close uh, rates as well. I have a few questions here. So let me just go one by one here. What is an appropriate amount of ongoing training for sales teams? That is a great question. So even at HubSpot, it varies, right? When I joined HubSpot, I joined a team we call our Solutions Partner Program. So that's where we work with marketing agencies to help them develop a service that is based on inbound marketing. Now, most sales reps that come to HubSpot go through a full month of training. Part of that month of training is they have to use HubSpot and do inbound marketing for a company that they create. That they would really need to use the tool to understand and become a deep 
um, have a deep understanding on how our product works and why it works, and really believe it as well, right? Um, now, for those who are coming into like the agency partner program, we actually get another month of training because apart from understanding how the software works, we need to understand how a marketing agency is going to make a business out of those services. So we need to understand how a marketing agency operates, understand their business model. So for us, it's two hours, uh, sorry, two months of training. So it really does depend. I think the best way to measure it is you just first you have to do an estimation. Okay, what do these people need to learn to be able to execute? And then you measure, right? Are they being successful? The ramp up to being a fully productive rep um, is it going up or is it going down? Like at HubSpot, we measure that. How, we know our, our rep productivity needs to be X. And so we measure how long does it take a new rep to get to that level of productivity? If we see that, st that time starting to slip, like you say, well, like you originally is six months. And then we start seeing, well, like lately it's been seven months. And then, oh, lately for the newest cohorts it's been eight months. That for us is a sign, hey, there's something wrong with our onboarding. There's actually, there's, either topics we're not addressing or there's a length of onboarding that we need to address because the newer reps are not as prepared to be successful as they were in the past. And it is actually logical, right? Like marketing technology is becoming a more competitive exp space. Our buyers are becoming more knowledgeable about products. So we need to be more knowledgeable about product than we were three years ago. So our onboarding changes, but time to full productivity is a good measure of, am I doing enough or not? To, to onboard new reps? That's a great question. And I think I have a few more slides, but I think we're, we're mostly done. Um, I would say, just to summarize what we discussed today is, frictionless sales um, really helps you align better and create a competitive advantage. Everything that we're talking about today, remember like most companies are not doing. So the, the competitive advantage and the arbitrage is, it's not really that expensive to do, and it will create at such a competitive advantage in acquiring customers versus your competition that is almost like a no-brainer. So remember, you need to focus on having a more efficient sales organization. You really need to focus on how do I have more trust from my buyers? How do I have deeper relationships? And how do I embed a culture of learning, of um, appetite for feedback in my sales team? Um, more so than, oh, I want to prove I'm the best sales rep. No, I want to have a team of reps that actually are seeking knowledge, seeking feedback, seeking for what are the ways for me to get better? What is that growth mindset in my sales team right now? So those are the three things I would suggest that um, you focus on. And that's all I had for today. Uh, if you had more questions, please, um, this is a great time also. If the time, um, if we're out of time, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, I'll be sure, uh, I'll be glad to keep the conversation going. Thanks again, Jose. That was an awesome session about frictionless selling and we appreciate your time. Um, and thank you again to HubSpot for sponsoring our sales and biz dev track today.